In the previous episodes, we have watched as the Soviets were defeated or stopped on each and every front by the resilient Finnish forces. Their initial invasion was very badly prepared and executed, and as a result, thousands of soldiers paid with their lives. Meanwhile, at the Karelian Isthmus, the Mannerheim Line remained unbreakable, a bastion for Finland's hope. Now that the Soviets have reorganized their forces and have amassed over 30 divisions on the Karelian Isthmus, a decisive operation is on the horizon. It's now or never for the Soviet Union in our fifth video on the Winter War. Shout out to the Ridge Wallet for sponsoring this video. Members of our team have been using Ridge Wallets for more than a year now, and we recommend them to all of our viewers. They don't fold, don't bulge in your pocket, and are light, with a modern, sleek, and industrial design. Ridge Wallets are a great Christmas gift for you and your loved ones. Ridge holds up to 12 cards and has an attached money clip for cash. It comes in 30 different colors and styles, including our favorites, carbon fiber and burnt titanium. For us, switching from the old wallets to Ridge was like going from an old chair to a super fancy gaming armchair. But don't take our word for it, Ridge has 40,000 five-star reviews. Each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty, and the Ridge team is so confident that you'll like it, that they'll let you try it for 45 days. If you don't love it, just send it back and get a full refund. Support our channel and get 10% off today, with free worldwide shipping and returns, by going to ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals and using code kingsandgenerals. The Soviet High Command was highly disillusioned by Meretskov's performance, and decided to replace him with Timoshenko, sending him 21 fresh divisions to prepare for a renewed offensive operation. As such, the 7th Army was reorganized into the Northwestern Front under Timoshenko himself, with Zhen's 8th, Troikov's 9th, and Frolov's 14th Armies directly reporting to Marshal Voroshilov's High Command. Timoshenko was ordered to breach the Mannerheim Line by any means necessary and bring the war to the Finnish heartland. Meretskov was then reassigned to lead the new 7th Army on the western side of the front, with 14 divisions in total, as he received 5 as reinforcement. Furthermore, 9 new divisions were assigned into the newly assembled 13th Army under Grendal, placed on the eastern side of the front, and the other 7 divisions were designated as general reserve for the operation. With so many troops on a single front, the Soviets had to divide their forces to maintain control over them, with Meretskov forming five army corps and Grendel forming three. In contrast, the Finns on the Mannerheim line were worn out after a month of intense fighting. Their fortifications were in a bad state, as throughout December and January, the Soviet artillery had shelled their positions daily and the Finnish forces were not only exhausted from resisting the Soviet onslaught, but also from repairing the dugouts and assault obstacles after the relentless enemy bombardment. The commander of the Army of the Isthmus, General Osterman, had grouped his troops into two formations, the Western 2nd Army Corps around Summa under General Orquist, and the Eastern 3rd Army Corps in the Taipale sector, led by General Heinrichs. Behind them, the Finns had the poorly manned interim line, with only a few emplacements and facilities for the defense of these positions. And behind this lay the final obstacle for the Soviet advance, the inadequately fortified rear line, which ran from Vipuri to Kupasari and from there to Kagisalmi. Although the Finns were heavily outnumbered, with only eight divisions against the overwhelming 30 Soviet divisions, the defenders were prepared to fight to the last. On February 1st, Timoshenko launched his offensive. On the Summa and Lada sectors, the 3rd Division of Colonel Palu had been hammered by several small Soviet assaults throughout January. When Meretskov's forces approached the Mannerheim line, it took a while for the defenders to realize this was no small attack, but a full army assaulting them. Within hours, the Soviets managed to capture a section of the trenches while bombarding the entire line. Each day they renewed their attacks, focused on acquiring a bunker here or a dugout there. These assaults were very successful, and some positions would remain in permanent Soviet control, further lowering the morale of the Finns. 
Despite these losses, Palu had withstood the Soviet assaults by February 10th. But this was just the beginning, as one day later, the 19th and 50th Rifle Corps started a joint offensive. The star of this offensive would be the 123rd Rifle Division, which managed to push through the Finnish lines just east of Lake Suma and capture Popius Bunker and all the strong points east of it. By afternoon, their attack had breached the Manaheim line and reached the interim line at Lada. Meanwhile, Palu threw back the Soviet attacks at other locations along the front and launched a quick counter-offensive against the 123rd. This counter-attack, however, lacked the arms and men needed and thus failed. As Manaheim became aware of the breakthrough later that night, he immediately ordered the Reserve 5th Division to the breach. In response, the Soviets started reinforcing the 123rd to capitalize on their success. Two battalions from the 5th hastened to counterattack the enemy, but despite pushing back the Soviets, they would be driven back by Soviet tanks later that day. As the defenders recovered from their failed counteroffensive, the Soviets started a bombardment of the interim line and their armored forces rolled straight through the Finnish defenses. Furthermore, just east of the Lada Road, the invaders had created a gap in the defensive line. The following day, the Soviets would continue to widen the breach while General Orquist threw every available reinforcement to stem this. If Lada fell, the Soviets could open up a passage in every direction through the Isthmus. In the meantime, fierce combat was taking place in the murky sector as the 19th Rifle Corps slowly progressed through the line of the 1st Division at great cost. By February 13th, the 90th Rifle Division had breached the Manaheim line at Murky and managed to push in several kilometers. That night, Commander Meretskov noted their tremendous success and ordered his corps to exploit this opportunity. At the same time, Orquist gave permission for the 5th to start withdrawing eastward and for the first to retreat towards the northeast. On the other side, the Soviets would not follow the disengaged Finns, instead consolidating. Meanwhile, Grendal's 13th Army had the objective of advancing through the Finnish defenses to the road network on the Kelia Korpikula Yaroseva line. On February 8th, the Soviets started their bombardment of the Taipalis sector, and the 3rd Corps launched a wide front assault resulting in the capture of two bases at the Tarantula hamlet. Two Finnish counterattacks had failed to regain it when a third desperate effort managed to return these positions to their hands. Suffering heavy losses, General Heinrichs had halted Grendal's assault, but just as in summer, this was just the beginning. On February 11th, the Soviets started a strong bombardment and launched a renewed offensive. The Finns fought tooth and nail and at the end of the day, they would still be in control of their main defenses. Furthermore, a surprise attack near Savanto forced the Soviets to relinquish their newly captured positions. This came at a hefty price in manpower, and the 7th Division's soldiers would have to be reinforced with the fresh 21st Division. For the next week, the defensive line waved back and forth as the defenders kept recapturing the positions lost on the previous day. By February 17th, Heinrichs had withstood the main Soviet assault, and now the situation was stable for the Finns at Taipale. When Grendal realized this, he ordered the 49th and 150th Rifle Divisions to cease their attacks and instead wear down the defenders with an incessant bombardment. On February 14th, Manaheim arrived to assess the situation on the front line. He quickly concluded that despite holding most of the main defenses, the breaches at Lada and Murky forced the Second Corps to retreat to the interim line. One day later, the exhausted and battered Finns started their retreat, and the Red Army allowed them to do so. By February 17th, all Finnish forces had made it to their designated positions at the interim line, and they would be reinforced by the 23rd Division coming from the Kola River. 
The last Finns to withdraw were the soldiers of the 4th Division on the Koivisto Islands, who escaped by skiing over the frozen Vipuri Bay to its west bank, establishing critical defensive positions at the islands around the city of Vipuri. Meanwhile, the Soviets kept applying pressure, resuming attacks against the new line immediately after their enemies had manned it. On February 22nd, the 23rd finally arrived to relieve the depleted 5th Division, and together they managed to halt the Soviets for a few days. At the same time, Ostermann was replaced by General Heinrichs. Furthermore, the experienced General Tavila would take control of the 3rd Corps, and General Latikainen would be assigned to command the new 1st Corps at the left flank of Orquist's 2nd. By February 18th, Grendel had restored the cohesion of his forces, and ordered them to renew their assault. This offensive was especially successful around Kervismaki, where the 150th Division routed a battalion of the 21st and took control of the strongholds on the southern side, while the 49th Division captured the forts at Tarentula, forcing the Finns to retreat to the interim line. After the fall of these defensive positions, the Soviets stopped their advance because they feared a Finnish counterattack, allowing Tavila to strengthen positions on the line one day later. The following night, the 7th Division launched a counteroffensive and took back control of the Tarentula sector. This position would go back and forth between the Finns and the Soviets, but by February 24th, the 7th Division had established more permanent positions. In March, Tavila issued a final retreat into the well-prepared bunkers of the rear line, but the war would end before Tavila reached and defended this last line. In the meantime, the second division of Colonel Koskimius would soon fall back to the concrete bunkers of the Arapa sector. As Taipale had proven too resilient, Grendal now directed his forces against these positions in the center of the interim line. Reinforced by the 19th Corps, the 23rd Rifle Corps was pushing north with the objective of securing the village of Antrea, while further east, the 15th Rifle Corps was assigned to cross the Vorsky River near the village of Arapa. Koskimiers resisted the Soviet attacks as best he could, but by February 29th, Grendal exercised complete control of the interim line west of Arapa, forcing the 2nd Division to retreat to the rear line. But from the village eastwards, Koskimir still controlled his defensive line, so Grendal ordered the 15th Corps to launch an offensive against Arapa's defenders. The commander planned to first destroy the defenses on the south side of the Vorsky, and then proceed straight across the Finnish rear to take the village. In turn, Koskimir left the 23rd Regiment to defend Arapa from the western assault of the 4th Rifle Division while he came forth to the east to receive the combined attack of the 17th Motorized and 97th Rifle Divisions. On March 1st, the Soviet offensive began, achieving a breakthrough the following day. But this wouldn't last, as later that day, Koskimiers managed to recapture the lost positions and push back. As a result, Grendel was replaced due to his repeated failures by Perusinov, who immediately issued new orders for an assault. This offensive would fail as well, but on March 4th, the 50th Rifle Division defeated the 8th Division and took a strategic hill east of Woselmi. With the elevated firing positions against them, the Finns south of the Vuoksi River and at Arapa would have to retreat to the shores. After the capture of Arapa, Perusinov continued his offensive against the large Vasikasari island in the center of the river. Although Koskimiers kept offering fierce resistance, the following day the 50th Division captured the island with great losses. On March 6th, the Finns attempted to regain the island, but Perusinov's forces repelled them and counterattacked, establishing a position on the shores of Wosalmi. A fierce struggle ensued in which Koskimiers ended up victorious pushing the Soviets back to Vesika Sari. Following this success, he would be reinforced by the 21st Division, and together they would manage to hold on until the end of the war. Meanwhile, as the rest of the 50th Corps continued their assault on the Lada breach, Meretskov had formed a new task force, 
consisting of two tank brigades and two infantry battalions, to take Vipuri on February 28th. But one day earlier, Urquist's forces had fully retreated to the still incomplete rear line, preventing this new offensive from ever launching. Merezkov, however, had managed to overrun the interim line in its whole length, and he was now preparing his forces for a final assault on the last Finnish defensive line. Right in front of Vipuri, the 3rd and 5th Divisions stood as their main obstacle, with the 4th Division protecting the bay to the west of the city. And immediately east from them, Lachikainen's 1st Division had taken positions east of the Tali crossroads, with the 23rd Division at its west in the town of Repola. Meretskov planned to do a two-pronged attack, with the bulk of the 7th Army skirting the city from the east to encircle the Finnish forces, while the 10th and the reservist 28th Rifle Corps had to cross the frozen bay west of Vipuri to secure the road to Helsinki. At this point, the Finnish government was working day and night to resolve the conflict peacefully before the invaders could do tremendous harm to their capital. The rear line had to be held, and Vipuri couldn't fall if they wanted to avoid complete occupation. Towards the end of February, overall command of Vipuri Bay was handed over to the newly formed Coastal Group, led by the experienced General Valenius. Their situation was very perilous, as the bay was frozen, allowing Soviet tanks to cross it, and by March 1st the Soviets had forced the 4th Division to retreat from the two large peninsulas extending into the bay. Valenius then placed his forces on a line of islands extending to the port of Vipuri, directly facing the three divisions sent by Meretskov. When the offensive began, the 800 strong defenders at Tupura managed to hold their ground against the invaders, but they couldn't stop them from occupying the smaller islands just north of the line. The following night, however, the Finns at Tupura found their position untenable and had to retreat to Tekasari Island. They would continue to resist there for an entire day before retreating to their final position at the Vilanyami Peninsula. At the same time, Valenius faced a great threat when the Soviets skied over to the Haranpanyami Peninsula and drove back the coastal defenders. But by March 3rd, the peninsula was back in Finnish hands. This forced Valenius to order a retreat from the island line to concentrate at Turkinsari, but despite his best efforts, he would then be replaced because of the disorganized state of his forces. In the meantime, Meretskov launched his eastern offensive against Vipuri on March 1st. The 34th Rifle Corps had the task of directly assaulting the city from the south and from the northeast, where the 5th Division stood in defense, while the 50th Corps advanced in the direction of Repola to eliminate the 23rd Division. On March 2nd, the 3rd Division defending Vipuri itself was assaulted by the 7th and 95th Rifle Divisions, and the Soviets managed to create a breach on the southern edge of the city. But the 3rd would continue to hold the Soviet attacks on the following days, further preventing the invaders from sweeping into the city. Simultaneously, the heroic 1st Division was holding down the 50th Corps on the Tali crossroads, and the 5th and 23rd Divisions were also resisting the relentless enemy attacks. Back at the bay, the new commander of the coastal group, General Lennart Usch, decided to recapture the key Taikasari Island on March 4th. This would fail, and soon the 86th Motorized Rifle Division created a bridgehead on the Haranpanyemi Peninsula. Usch quickly launched a counterattack to regain this position, but by March 5th, the 86th couldn't be dislodged. At the same time, the Finns in Vilanyemi were finally routed, so the Soviets continued eastwards towards Vipuri until they were stopped on the Kayanyemi Peninsula. The next day, Ush attempted to recapture Vilanyemi, with both sides suffering heavy losses. Although the Finns had contained this breach, the Soviets had managed to cut off the road to Helsinki, achieving their main goal. With Vipuri isolated from the capital, Finnish Prime Minister Ristoriti was finally granted permission from Moscow to travel there and start the peace talks. While these negotiations lasted, 
Heinrichs and Mannerheim knew that they needed to hold the invaders at bay. On March 9th, the 70th Rifle Division on Villaniemi was reinforced by the 173rd Motorized Rifle Division, and one day later, they advanced northward beyond the road. Towards the Puri, they would finally be stopped by the recently assembled Group Varko coming from the city. Meanwhile, on Uras Island, the 4th Division was enjoying great success on March 9th against the 43rd Rifle Division, and only after being reinforced by the 42nd and 113th Rifle Divisions did the 43rd manage to capture the island. The rest of the island would be lost the following day, and the 4th would have to retreat to the Koivuniemi Peninsula in defense of the coast. Simultaneously, Meretskov launched a new main offensive against the Puri on March 11th. But the Finns fought to the last man and resisted both the artillery barrage and the Soviets' incessant attacks. Orquist's position was becoming untenable with each passing day, and so he requested permission to abandon the city. But Manaheim knew the importance of maintaining Vipuri, and he knew that the war was near its end, so he ordered his men to maintain the city at all costs. On March 12th, Meretskov was preparing for a final assault on the surrounded Vipuri, coming both from south and west, but before the Soviets could exploit their breakthrough on the city, Ruti capitulated to Stalin's terms. A day later, the terms of the Moscow Peace Treaty were announced, and the fighting stopped. Immediately, the majority of Heinrich's forces started to withdraw to the newly agreed borders, while the depleted 3rd Division remained in Vipuri to lower down the national flag, as the city had been annexed by the Soviet Union. The territorial losses that Finland suffered ended up being more than what the Soviets initially demanded. Although the war ended in defeat, it was remarkable that the Finns had managed to hold on for so long against the Soviet onslaught. The Finnish casualties were around 70,000, 25,000 among them dead. More than 150,000 Red Army soldiers were killed, and 200,000 more were wounded. The Soviets also lost around 400 aircraft and more than 3,000 tanks, which would prove to be important when Hitler attacked the USSR 15 months later, the attack that the Finns joined, starting the Continuation War. We will continue covering modern wars in the upcoming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.